welcome to The Big Deal, where we unlock the details and drama behind the business of sport in Australia and around the world. Join me, Warren Treadray, along with Andrew Montessi and our expert guests as we take you into the boardroom for behind-the-scenes access and analysis of contracts, negotiations, endorsements and much more. Subscribe to our show on your favourite podcast player and don't forget to sign up to www.thebigdeal.au for a weekly wrap of the latest deals, breaking news and many more exclusive opportunities. How you going, everyone? I'm Jack, and this is a big deal. We're back again, and Treaders, um, we've got a special guest this week, mate. Yeah, we certainly have, Jack. We talk about uh, the uh, medical fraternity and sports medical fraternity. We've got one of the biggest names. He was one of Australia's um, most senior sports physicians. Uh, he served as a uh, team doctor of a wide range of sports, including AFL, track and field, cricket, triathlon, lacrosse. He's done everything, Commonwealth Games, Olympics. As we mentioned, AFL clubs spent some time with Adelaide and Geelong. Uh, covered the medical services for the 2000 Olympics and most recently has written a book. So he's an author, The Healthy 100, 100 Ways to Be Happier, Healthier and to a Longer Life. Well, I tell you what, that's the first thing I'll be reading. And our good mate has joined us, Dr. Peter Larkins, uh, to the big deal. Thanks for your time, Pete. Hi, uh, guys. Nice to talk to you. Uh, yeah, looking forward to our chat. Now, uh, Doc, we, we touch on the AFL. You work many years in the AFL system. You're still consulting former AFL players and current AFL players. Uh, obviously, as a doctor, but we talk about concussion challenging the game. Now, what is it we don't know? Because we're seeing the rules change, we're seeing everything happen, and everyone just goes, ah, oh, the game's gone soft. What does a doctor think of this who's clearly had a, a long influence in the match? Yeah, well, we know a lot. There's a lot more we don't know than we do know, I guess, about the situation. I mean, I've been in footy for a long, long time, and, um, you know, both uh, playing junior footy when concussion wasn't even acknowledged and, and you know, the era at the time when if you, if you got a hit to the head, you just sucked it up and you went back on the ground. You were soft if you didn't. I've seen the evolution since 2010 where there began a great concern around the world about long-term consequences developing, particularly in overseas sports like uh, ice hockey and, and the jockeys in, the, in, in racing and in soccer. And, of course, we've seen the AFL then adapt this uh, welfare policy, for want of a better word, where the player's health becomes the concern. But there are still more questions. What we've seen change dramatically is, is match day management for players where obviously you don't go back on the ground if, there's, if the diagnosis of concussion is definitely made. Um, and that's controversial just how to make that and, and, of course, the consequences of that. And then it's the protocol afterwards that's really challenging people is how long do you miss after concussion? What are the criteria before you're allowed to turn to train and return to play? And that's evolving enormously right up to 2024 where the AFL, for example, has this guideline of the so-called 12 days. And now we've seen the Sports Commission and the Institute of Sport for all suburban footballers, all the country footballers, the underage footballers, where they've brought out a 21-day recommendation before you return to play. And that just reflects what we don't know about the brain and how slowly it, it, it does take to get better, particularly in younger younger brains. So it's no, no question under 18, it takes longer to get better. But the challenge on match day is really still a big thing for, for both AFL sports and, of course, all the community sport. So take us through, like, the uh, obviously the head injury assessment. What do doctors look for in that? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you look. There's a, there's content. There's symptoms and signs. So symptoms are things that you tell me, Jack. So you tell me that you've got a headache. You tell me you've got blurred vision. You, you tell me that you 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 can't remember the incident because I can't see that. What I see the signs are of you being unsteady on your feet or just being glassy eyed or your loss of balance and things like that. So. So where it has really improved at the elite level, of course, is the video replays that everyone sitting at home in the grandstand becomes an expert because you get to see um, a player's reaction. And we talk often this praise the Lord where you see the player go down and the hands go in the air. And even if it's only for a mi many few seconds, you get that uh, posture, um, then that's a sign that the brain has switched off. And even though the player may wake up and get up and be good a bit afterwards. So, so what the doctors are looking for these days at the elite level, they've got the vision. So that's great. They've got you see, they often see them on the sidelines. They're, they're looking at the laptop, the doctor and the physios together. And then they'll run out and they'll talk to the player. Now, sometimes, as you know, if it's on the other side of the field, it's a 20 or 30 second process before the, 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 the doctor can even catch up with the player, particularly if they're a bit of an overweight doctor. They're not going to catch the player if he's taking off. <laughs> but then you're doing a little bit of it. You do a, a head injury assessment, an HIA. And a head injury assessment is just you working out and me talking to you about, you know, do you really realise you just had a head hit? Uh, you remember it? You know, how clear are you? 
And, and you know, that head injury assessment on the field it really determines whether you come off and have a more serious concussion assessment, which is called the SCAT test, the sports concussion assessment tool. Or, you know, if the video comes in and I see that you are a bit more concerned or I'm concerned about you, you will come off anyway. So so that's really easy, I say, at AFL level because you see players coming off all the time going downstairs. And I think that's improved a lot. But where we really fall between the cracks and where all the hundreds and hundreds of concussions are around the country every weekend is really in junior sport and suburban sport. And we're not, well, they're not getting into medical care properly, Travis. Yeah, that, that's a massive challenge. Um, but we, take it in terms of how we go the individual player, whether it's at the AFL top level or uh, an AFLW or you say suburban amateur footy. How can a player see their condition deteriorate over a period of time? You know, what can they see or do they not see it and they just realise that maybe I'm oh, just a bit slower reaction over time? Yeah, well, a lot of players, I mean, look, we talk about statistics about how many concussions there are and the bottom line is we don't know how many there are because many of them don't get reported. People get a knock, they get a ding or whatever. If they're, if they're not in an, in a lead environment, they necessarily won't get a good assessment on the day and then they'll go, they'll go home after the game or after the match or wherever it is. Now, you can get this delayed onset where you know yourself you're not feeling well. And and the words that are on the concussion assessment form that people fill out, you know, obviously things like headache, dizziness, blurred vision, everyone understands that. But then there's other words that players use that they're feeling a bit foggy in their head. They don't feel right. Um, they, they're just not on their game. And, and we all know what, sort of what those words mean, but it's the sort of thing that you start to notice about yourself that you just feel off the pace a little bit. And that's when you really think, oh, maybe that head knock it is going to be an evolving concussion. It can be hours. It can even be 24 hours later. And this is where I guess people that don't have access to an elite medical team so easy, they can't just ring up the club doctor and ring Barnsley or ring, you know, whoever they're going to ring in the days, ring fish at, at Port Adelaide and, and say, oh, look, you know, I'm just, I'm feeling really unwell. I'm, and then, you know, I might be nauseated if you're getting worse, the headache or the, the sensitivity to bright lights, the so-called photophobia. So those sort of things evolve and people that recognise that in themselves because they say, I just don't feel right. And then, then, then they need to go and get some healthcare professional. We generally say it's the GP, but they need to be educated better about sport because a lot of them are off the pace at the present time, to be honest. And like more recently, we've had um, obviously Angus Brayshaw's retired. So, what extent does a player have to be at to basically be forced to retire um, with yeah. their concussions? Yeah, that's a really good example because obviously we saw Gus really miss an entire year of footy uh, back. Mm was it 2018 into 2019 off the back of the fact there that he'd had four heavy concussions in a 12 month period was taking longer to recover from each one, which is the standard thing. The more you have often, the more it takes to recover. Yeah. Um, and so he came back and played and I was quite surprised. I, I thought he may have pulled the pin on playing because of this history at that stage. And then he wore the helmet famously and, and had, um, you know, a few years where, through that COVID time and playing, and, and luckily in a, in a game where head, head hits are, are pretty common, he didn't get a big hit again. And then we saw the massive hit that occurred in September, the so-called Maynard incident. Mm. And that really sort of, what really tipped the balance about his retirement there, Jack, was he then had serial scans that had been done over the course of the early years. So they knew what his brain scans looked like. They knew how many he'd had and the symptoms, but the scan changes that showed up on this 2024 incident and up off the back of the 2023 hit showed changes in the brain that hadn't been there before. So he was now getting to this group of players that was starting to show changes on a scan. Most concussions don't show changes on a scan. Oh, wow. So the, the tipping point for him, if you like, was the fact that his brain was now showing wear and tear that hadn't shown up before with some of the new technology that, to be fair, wasn't available, you know, back when I was a club doctor, even when Tredis, when you were playing. So the new scans have become more sophisticated. So this became then a lifestyle decision with how many times do you want to be hit, Gus? And the answer is we don't know the magic number. There's no set number to say three is the bad number or five is the bad number. On world sport, there's no set number of concussions that tips you into too many. I mean, one concussion can ruin a player's career, and we've seen that with someone like Liam Picken, for instance, at, at mm. the Bulldogs, who hasn't played for a couple of years off the back of a really serious bad one concussion that he never got through. And then you've got other guys that could say they've had 10 or 11 and they're still playing, but I reckon it really would have triggered anxiety in a lot of players, guys, with the, the racial one because now they're realising that a number of big hits can lead to problems and we've got so much emphasis about long-term behaviour inju injuries in, in ex-players and brain injury and we're talking about dementia and Alzheimer's and this 
famous CTE word gets brought up. So there's a real awareness, if you like, about repeat concussions leading to long-term problems. And because Gus Brayshaw, to come back to him, was showing some signs, and that was a really heavy hit, Yeah, it really triggered him. And you can see, just quickly without getting distracted about helmets, I mean, he was wearing a helmet. But if you get hit front on in the face, you know, which would, can happen in sport, then clearly the helmet wasn't going to protect from that anyway. Yeah. Do, 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 Doc, do helmets help or work? Because yeah. there's, there's a thought that, oh, yeah, it, concussion's the whiplash and a helmet yeah. only stops abrasion, if you know what I mean. Like, is, is yeah. it as simple as that or what's your take? Well, it's as simple as that if you want to say what happens to the brain when you get hit in the head. It shakes. You know, you've got a, you've got a bone cavity, a rigid bone cavity, and you've got this piece of jelly called the brain sitting in there in liquid. And so if you hit that cavity, the, the jelly is going to shake from side to side. It doesn't matter whether you're a helmet or not. And, in fact, you argue if you put a helmet on, the target's bigger. You look at the American helmets that the guys wear. You look at the, the motorbike helmets. You know, they're massive big things. Um, but I believe that helmets reduce head injuries, Treaders. And in, in what I mean is if you've ever had a broken eye socket, if you've ever had a jaw, if you've ever had a, a skull fracture, or if we see all the blood rule where you've got to get sent off now and be stitched up, I mean, those sort of abrasions and those bone fracture injuries will definitely be reduced by I mean, if I've got a choice, if I'm going to smack you in the head, Treaders, and I say, look, you can just take it on the chin, mate, or you can put a helmet on and I'll smack you on the chin where the helmet protects your chin, I bet you'll, you'll put the helmet on. Yeah, but I'm still going to shake your head. Tyson. Yeah, <laughs> but my, my, your point's right. The, the, the biomechanists and, and all the sports scientists say, well, okay, if, you, if the brain shakes, then it doesn't matter whether you're helmet or not, it's still going to shake. And that shaking from one side then hitting back to the other side causes some traction of the lining tissue in the brain. It causes the electrical shutdown. And so we haven't worked out a way to stop that by putting a helmet on. We'll go back to Brayshaw just quickly, Doc. Um. Do you like the fact that the AFL made the call on him? Um, yes and no. I mean, it sort of means why wasn't the call made by his own individual medical team and the medical staff? I mean, I've, you know, I'm not trying to fly the flag for the club doctors, but gee, we've got some really experienced guys around the country. Player welfare is the number one thing, whether it's the hamstring or the broken ribs or, or, or the head injury. And so I think that it, you know, it's not the first time the AFL has stepped in, as you may know, to, to advise or guide um, the clubs about a player that they're concerned about that's had multiple concussions. And there's this new concept of what we call shared decision-making. So it's the player, it's the family, it's the medical advice, both at the club level and then the experts that the club might have brought in. And the club's got access to great experts that are provided through the AFL network on where people go during the week and have their scans and the neuropsychological testing, as it's called. But ultimately, the AFL is monitoring that so closely that if they don't think the club is making the decision to, um, in the best interest of the long-term health of the player, they can come in on board on that, which is what we saw with Brayshaw. But I think in the majority of retirement decisions, the AFL doesn't come into it. But with the brain one, there's been a couple where they've had the final say, if you like. Now, Doc, um, how big a challenge is this to the game? Obviously, it's an on-field on element. There's a player wealth, uh, well, he yeah. healthy and, and welfare issue because it is an employment space. And then there's also a financial element where the AFL appears to be putting in a lot of resources and, and a lot of investigation into trying to minimise this as much as possible for their athletes. Yeah, look, I think, in, well, it, it probably is the biggest challenge to the game at the present time because of the concept of um, even parents who are looking at what sport they want their young girls and guys to play. And so you're looking to say, well, how safe is that sport and what's the injury risk? And, of course, when we're talking about brain injury, it sort of really rises up there because of the long-term health consequences that might have. Um, so I think the risk is, is enormous there. It's probably the biggest risk I've seen over a period of time, along with the mental health challenges of, of players that have retired. And, are, and we all know there's, um, you know, court cases going on and, and, and um, litigation in place, you know, with, with class actions about that. So that's a threat to the reputation of the sport, I believe, as, as it is with, with American football, with the NFL, when they had the payout over there. So, so I think, you know, the issue is how do we completely eliminate concussion in, in footy, you can't. I mean, it, it's a contact collision, high-velocity sport. And we've got other sports where it's never been eliminated. We can bring, bring in rules about sling tackles and and um, and spear tackles and, and protecting the player with the head over the ball and all the things that we've seen the AFL adopt. And I can give you 10 examples of rules that they've adopted to help player welfare. 
Then I was quite the example in 2023, guys, you know, when we talk about responsibility, duty of care of one player to another, I talk about the game Geelong versus Melbourne when I was down there and, and Gary Rowan absolutely cleaned up Jezza uh, Cameron, mm. two, two teammates, right? Broke two ribs, dislocated his AC joint and knocked him into the next suburb, into West Geelong. Now, there's a contest where you, you can't say that Gary Rowan was in any way malicious towards his teammate. So even two teammates can concuss each other. We're never going to eliminate it in a sport with where eyes are on the ball and you get players going in for that. Um, but I think all we can say is we're going to try and make it as safe as possible. We're going to make sure that medical care is put into place. And ironically, I'm talking tonight to a, a league. They're, they're launching their season tonight. Guys, have got 11,000 participants in this league, 400 clubs. This is a junior club. It's the biggest junior uh, sports league in, in Australia for Aussie rules footy. And their concern, of course, is what happens to the, the kids and how do they get medical care during the week because parents are concerned about it. And it comes back to what I said about recruiting into the sport you know are people going to play basketball yes you can get concussed but not as much are that people going to go into soccer or are they going to go into tennis rather than play footy so i think we've got a dilemma of showing you know that we've got the best environment we can we're looking at prevention techniques um and the other thing and i don't know how you feel about this Curtis, but you you would have heard as i did and jack you know the concept of, of eliminating tackling at training so that you're not allowed to tackle a training but you know the, the amount of times that you, you have a physical contact um, in European soccer under 15, you're not allowed to head the ball at training guys anymore because of the risk of the head shape. So you're learning, you're eliminating one of the basic skills of the sport. It'd be like me saying to a football, you don't kick the ball in case you get a sore foot at training. Well, how are we going to develop the skills? But this is one of the things that's being brought in to try and not make it a threat to the game is to eliminate the number of tackling sessions. Um, we already know that there's no non-contact junior footy where you're not allowed to tackle maybe that goes into higher age groups just to prevent the risk or prevent the, the likelihood of getting a head injury in, in your younger days so you don't come into senior football with a history of head injuries i mean it, it, all this is currently under discussion i know that's a, a vague answer guys but we're currently looking at all the things that might help reduce concussion not how do we treat it better we want to reduce the fact that it happens in the first place now doc quickly just on that isn't part of the actual training week to week actually building the resolve for taking the bumps and if you know what I mean. But if you didn't do it, I feel like you're, you're yeah. more susceptible to cop one because it's almost like yeah. that theory. I haven't gone for a run for a while, so I'm going to go real hard on my first run yeah. and wonder why you're so sore and you can't yeah. move. Is there an element of that too against that argument? Well, I, I think you picked up on my scepticism and asked you why I thought about it, Trittis, because you're actually, yeah. you can't be not tackling a training and then suddenly get into an opposition game this Saturday where the opposition is going to go at you hard with tackling you and you're not hardened up for it. As yeah. I said, it's not like not kicking a training and then you've got to kick a goal and because you're not allowed to have too many kicks a goal because you might strain your quad. So the sports science guys yeah. say, oh, we don't want to do that. So we've seen these other sort of limitations on training come in over the last decade or so to protect player from, from load. But this concept of being able to take a tackle, to be able to take a bump, if you don't do it in training, you're going to get smashed in the game. We've seen that a little bit with the AFLW guys because these girls have come from a background where they're not used to tackling, they're not used to bumps, they're not used to this 360-degree concept of the game. Then they get into a match against an opposition and they get hit. And so we've seen a much higher incidence pound for pound of hamstrings, ankles, concussions, knee ACLs. We could go on and on in the women's footy because the women haven't had that training or that background growing up. And if you don't do it as a kid and you don't do it at training, my concern is you're dropping away your skill set that you're going to have to apply when you get into the match. We've seen, obviously, some, obviously you mentioned the rule changes, Doc, um, but obviously this year the 21-day protocol for community level compared to the 12-day AFL, um, do you think they should all come into line? It's, it's certainly caused confusion, hasn't it? Um, yeah. So to put some perspective on that, Jack, the 12-day rule is not a rule. It's a guideline that was brought in on the basis of the world experience showing that the majority, and I'll use the word carefully, the majority of concussions got better within 14 days. So whether you're talking about soccer, whether you're talking about ice hockey, um, other sports. And so the concept of missing the first week after you play sort of made sense because a lot of the times the protocol of, going for a walk and then going for a run and then going for some, doing some skills training without contact and then doing skills training with contact and then match simulation then match. That takes more than seven days. So that's the stage protocol that everyone should go through. And so the AFL have introduced that, used that as a guideline. Clearly, if you get diagnosed with the big C word concussion this weekend coming, you're going to miss the following week. Now, you might miss three or four depending on the severity, but generally at the 12-day mark, we're seeing most people come back. 
But then the sports commission and a lot of sports were saying, well, you know, that's fine if you've got elite care, if you're in an AFL program, you've got doctors and physios on the sideline with you from day zero when you get injured and you go into this protocol and you're at the club every day. What I said to you before applied is hundreds of these concussions are happening in the community where kids don't even know they've been concussed and they're not presenting until day three or day four to their GP. And younger brains under 18 take longer to get better. And so we can't apply this elite adult plan. So the, the Sports Commission, who are very influential, and obviously the AIS is their, their elite arm of the Sports Commission, they control funding to all the junior sports, netball, hockey, you know, basketball, junior footy. And so they put out a guideline that really is more of a conservative, and I think it reflects the evolving conservatism of looking after amateur players, and they've made it a 21-day guideline. And that being that in the first, from day zero to day seven, you've got to wait for your symptoms to resolve, see a doctor, see a physio. And if you've got no symptoms, you then have a 14-day exclusion period before you're allowed full contact training. Hence, this is where it moves into week three. And so the 21-day there is more of a conservative approach. If you said, show me the science, show me the evidence that that's better, we can't, other than knowing that young brains take longer to get better and people that don't get early care take longer to get better. And that usually applies to most of the community ones. They're younger brains and they don't get the early care. But it really is, it's created a little bit of confusion because saying, well, does that mean that AFL players somehow get better quicker? No, they don't. They just have better care on the way through. And I can see it coming into line eventually that they might all be the same, Jack. Yeah. Yeah, Doc, uh, the biggest, obviously, bit with this concussion is the player injuries. But, you know, if there were no player injuries, we wouldn't have this... Um litigation that's happened obviously the NFL had a massive payout years ago there's a group of AFL players who are going through that same process now and obviously as you said 30 years ago we were dealing with concussion very very differently and and we, we know a lot more about it now do you see this as the biggest challenge from the game you, you mentioned it from a an, an injury point of view but also a financial point of view because insurers will be on the hook if this goes a payout towards players and then premiums yeah. will then potentially players could we be in a case where players are entering the field with having signed waivers to yeah. earn their money yeah i don't want to sound like a lawyer here but clearly this is a medico legal issue and it gets talked about at the afl doctors association meetings and, and across other um areas that i, that I work with treaders and, and you're right i mean the, the concept of the payouts and the litigation bothers me a little bit because you know, you've got to look at what was the contemporary acceptable treatment of the day. If someone's going to sue me for giving them negligent or inappropriate treatment and I can prove that that was the acceptable, appropriate treatment at the time, I wasn't being negligent looking after yeah. those players because that was the accepted thing around the world. And so when these litigation cases are coming out and people, you know, and there's a few people on their high horse and their, their soapbox, and I know they, they've got player welfare, and so don't let me belittle that in any way, but... But they're saying, oh, the AFL knew about this, the AFL was negligent. Well, I say, prove that the AFL was negligent. Prove that they knew that there were long-term consequences. I mean, I don't think that's true. I think this has been completely exaggerated. And I'm not saying there are not players out there that are suffering consequences of multiple concussions and, and head injuries treaters, potentially. But you've also got to look at the other lifestyle factors that may have contributed around those players. So it's the same with the NFL. You know, you've got to look at, you know, the lifestyle of these players and what, what's their off-field activities been like, whether it's been related to alcoholism, to drug use, to anger management, you know, depression and anxiety and, and anger are things happening in the community anyway. So back to litigation, yes, it is a risk, but but I would have thought this is going to go on for a long, long time. You've got two competing legal teams saying, that, well, you were negligent, and they're saying, no, we're not. We did what was accepted protocols. So I think it's, it's a really messy situation, and I just don't see it being resolved. And the problem was the NFL rolled over. They didn't want to contest it, so they paid out the seven hundred and fifty-eight million US dollars, Treaders, rather than contest the case against the suicides, domestic violence associated with brain injury from footy, and that sort of set the scene to say that they admitted that they were at fault. They didn't. They just they thought the battle and the, the cost would actually be be more than that, which is which is mind blowing to think it cost more than that. Because also too, like let's be to be honest, like if you've got head injuries and I don't want to downplay anyone who's got serious concussion injuries because it just ruins people's life but I know that I've got a knee that doesn't move too, too well that's a workplace injury but I also know the fact that I played a collision sport and I, yeah. and I have the theory that you start in nappies and end in nappies with professional sport because I don't know anyone that comes out better yeah well look I've always said if you played five years of elite footy you're going to have some memory of it 
in, in your body, uh, whether it's been a shoulder or a knee or an ankle. And, and, and I think I'm pretty right with that, you know. Uh, but it comes back to this waiver issue because that's a real issue. Because, you know, you don't get you don't sign a waiver when you're drafted this year to play footy to say, I accept that I might get a knee ACL and I'll get arthritis in my knee and I'll need a replacement. I accept that I might get a, a hip injury or I might do a hammy. I mean, it sort of goes with the territory and we've known that growing up. But suddenly we've got this injury called the brain and, you know, you can do a knee replacement, you can do a hip replacement, you can't do a brain replacement, guys. So it is, it, it's a much more emotional topic to have but the question is where do you draw the line which is i think what you're asking me Travis, is where do you draw the line when you sign up to play a sport you accept it's a contact and collision sport and you might get injured now the question is will legally that stand up um you know because there's always informed consent i mentioned shared decision making about gus brachial before so when players are, are coming back to play with a half healed ankle or a half healed crack in their in their in their hand and they might be playing with a glove on, just to mention a recent uh, example of a player that we saw in the last week that went into surgery having tried to play. They have informed consent to say they know they're going to play, they know that the, the injury might get, get worse. And doctors do sign off those waivers on a, on a week-to-week basis for certain injuries where the players take the risk. But coming into the sport, for your, your comment that you made, you just can't. I can't see how that's ever going to work because otherwise no one will come into the sport if they say, oh, look at all the things, I might die. You know, I might, I might, I might um, have a, a heart rhythm problem. I might, um, you know, there's been serious injuries in footy that go beyond that, and you just can't predict them all. I want to take the tribunal aspect, Doc. Um, obviously, a lot of players being suspended for coming into contact with the head. Do you think it's sort of the right move in terms of the suspension length, especially this year? Yeah, this year's a tricky one because we've really seen a reaction, haven't we, mm. from from what happened? And, and again, without harping on the incident with Maynard, I mean, I, I wondered what people say what. When I looked at that, I thought, oh, gee, what alternative did he have? And I felt a bit sorry for him, although, of course, it was very significant for Brayshaw in terms of what happened to him. But they changed that because now players, the duty of care aspect comes in and we've seen some really heavy penalties laid down, you know, in the preseason and, and in, in the first four to five rounds, Jack, because the players are getting the message or the AFL sending a strong message. And, 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 you, know, and you know what it's like, that in, the speed of the game is so fast, decision-making... But I guess we're trying to say, we, back to what I said before, the AFL is putting into place every potential message, trying to get the players to understand. And the difficulty, and Tritus, you'll appreciate this, is when you're in a contest, what are you going to do? You're going to back out of the contest? I mean, because remember what would happen in the old days if you backed out of a contest. You weren't playing next week. You, you weren't playing, and, and, the, and the crowd would go nuts, right, well, for the next well, month. But even the, next, the last 24 hours, Doc, we, we've seen Matt Crouch get suspended for one week and you've got Butters who's got off. And I think both of them were generally just playing the footy. Yeah. yeah. So that's the bit that probably that fine line for us footy fans who just go, wow, yeah. the fundamentals of the game have changed. Yeah. And it, we're expecting people have played their whole life to adapt instantly, which is a very, very difficult. Yeah, but it has to be. There's plenty of things where players have had to adapt, you know, like the head over the ball and leading with your head, you know, where the free kick's now paid against you for leading with your head because you're putting yourself at risk. So, so there's, you know, it's the slide rule where you used to slide in. You know, I call it the Gary Rowan rule because he was in Sydney yeah. when he, he broke his tibia really bad and it was called the Rowan rule in the medical world. So that concept of slide coming, because not only was it a broken tibia, you can take out your medial ligament or your ACL that way. That was more important for us as the doctors. But but back to your point, I mean, what we've now got is everything in slow motion from six different angles. You've got biomechanists coming in. And all you can say to the players is keep your eye on the ball because if you look at some of these suspension ones, what they're picking on Treaders is that last little minute where the player takes his eye off the ball and he looks at the opposition person and then turns. So it's, it's, it's instinctive. It's instinctive in the brain when you do that. It's a self-protective thing, but, but they're saying you took your eyes off the ball. And you, when you see two people coming in, and so, look, it is. And I mentioned the Rowan and, and Jeremy Cameron incident where two teammates did it, you know, and that clearly wasn't a malicious thing. It was a contest of two genuine players going for the ball and, and the, they both got injured in that contest. So so I think it's a learning curve. It will mean that the fabric of the game changes a bit, Tredis, I reckon, because players will have to back off a little bit. And you, you already see it a little bit, you know, with you pull out, a, you have a tackle and you go to tackle and then they pull their arms back because they don't want to have the sling anymore. So... It, it takes a season or two, but I guess we've got to be shown to be doing the right thing. Uh, Doc, I think we'll, take, we'll go into a bit of the um, AFL's illicit drugs policy, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, we're going to go from a, something that was not controversial to something that's not controversial. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks for that. Uh, the, the topics <laughs> of the week. <laughs> but um, well, obviously we spoke about the um, impact the concussions had, but do we have a 
big issue on our hands with obviously that's everything that's come out the last six or so weeks. Yeah, we have. I mean, I, I got a little bit amused when I heard it, all the, the headlines and the brouhaha because this is a policy that's been in place for for a long time. I mean, we go back to 2005 when the so-called illicit drug policy was introduced on top of the performance policy. So just to be a little, dumb it down just briefly for a, a minute, you know, we've got a performance enhancing policy. It's called the WADA policy. It applies to Olympics and Commonwealth Games and all the, the sports. And that's looking at people that cheat by taking a performance enhancing drug. And it's it's a it's a random testing match day and during the week. But we all knew, if you go back to 2005, there was lots of speculation about AFL players that might have been using uh, amphetamines, cocaine, ecstasy, other drugs at the time. Ice wasn't so much a big discussion then, but there's a few others that came on, on board. Ketamine's an example of a, of a medical drug that was being used. So the AFL said in its wisdom that they wanted to have an intervention medical policy. So this concept of a player being able to have a positive strike, so-called, and not be shamed on the front page or on the headline of the, of the nightly news was brought into place to find out, you know, if the players could be brought into a policy of intervention. And that doesn't happen to their mates who are out there taking cocaine or taking amphetamines or, or, or marijuana. So this was a, to say, OK, you come in as an 18 or 19-year-old, you kind of come out at the end of the AFL career being a better person. So this whole concept of player welfare, and, and you're not going to be a drug user at the end of that, ideally, because whilst your mates don't get intervention, you will. Now, I never agreed with the three strikes policy. I thought that was too lenient. I was always a two strikes policy person when it came in in 05. And then about a decade ago, this other option where it really muddied it was this self-reporting came in. So if a player had been a naughty boy or accidentally naughty boy on a Wednesday or Thursday night at his <laughs> mate's birthday, he could then go to the club doctor and say, look, I think I may have stuffed up during the week, um, you know, and the player can get tested confidentially. And if he tested positive, there was the dilemma because he wasn't allowed to play because he would get hit by WADA on the weekend. And therefore, that's a four year. So this concept of the play, but that, that wasn't where it ended. Where, where the, the news reports got it wrong was the player then went into an um, intervention policy with the club doctor supervising that to find out why they'd used the cocaine during the week. Was it a first time? And, and they were supposed to be give, put on a pathway of medical care so they weren't shamed. Now, that has solved and, and resolved the problem for dozens and dozens of players who accidentally just once went off track, one indiscretion, right? And they weren't protected. They were protected from the WADA for that day, but they, were, they weren't, it wasn't swept under the carpet is what I mean. So the only reason it got into trouble was there were certain players who were repeat offenders and they knew they could exploit, the, put the hand up, self-report. And that's the group where the doctors under the confidentiality agreement were a bit handcuffed because they still weren't allowed to tell the coach. They're not allowed to tell the AFL because they're supposed to be looking after their patient and get them into a program of rehabilitation so they don't become substance abusers permanently as an AFL player. And that was the intention of that. And, of course, what and I think almost every club, the 18 clubs, have had players that have been rescued by that. But there has been a few, and this is where it came out controversy with this story, that potentially were going back and back again. And I think that's where the policy, it's not perfect in any way, shape or form, where there wasn't a big enough stick to stop people being repeat offenders. And that's where I think the changes will have to come. And also to the reporting, Doc, the, the discussion in the article, which was a great article for in terms of journalism and getting to the nitty gritty of something that probably people don't really want to touch. It's a bit sticky. They're saying there was 100 players who were caught in this process. If you go to AFL side of the argument, they argued that there's probably less than 10. So, yes, it is a minority, but there's also the theory, too, that, you know, you, you go and fly a plane, you go and work on the wharfs, it's a zero tolerance. Where do you sit with that? Because I'm sort of, I'm not a drug taker. I'm probably a more of a zero tolerance man, but I also yeah. understand people make mistakes. It's not yeah. an easy one, is it? No, it's not. And, and Tredis, I, I really have to be careful when I discuss this because I, I struggle between wearing my ex-athlete hat. Yeah, which I was absolutely a no drug user, couldn't stand sheets, you know, and just to age myself. I mean, I, I competed in the 1970s and 1980s on the on the world athletic stage, treaders, and I was up against the East Germans, the Russians, the Czechoslovakians, the Romanians, you know, um, and so I, I had a really no tolerance to, to anyone who, who was using drugs from a cheap point of view. But the medical side of me also knows that we're in a society where we're talking a 20 to 30 age group 
where whether we're talking about in the industry of media, whether we're talking about the entertainment industry, whether we're talking about the medical world, the legal world, there are people out there that are exposed and are using these products. And so our cohort of 800 players in the AFL are clearly going to be exposed to that. But my athlete hat says there's a certain obligation and discipline and expectation that goes with getting paid $400,000 a year to kick a footy around on the weekend and have fun and get all your gear supplied to you and your food. And I know that's sort of dumbing it down a bit too much, Tredis, but but that was my attitude that, you know, you're expected to train hard, you're expected to eat well, you're expected to play the team game, you know, and, and there's team rules and tactics. But I think there's an expectation that you don't, do what your mates are doing during the week and, and get on drugs. And so, you know, that's why I didn't like the three-strike policy because players could exploit that twice and still not get into trouble. So the two-strike policy was something that I sort of... I mean, everyone can make one mistake, Treaders. I don't want to hang every player out because they have one... You know, and there are... The AFL tells me there are instances of drink spiking. There are instances of people being set up by an ex-girlfriend, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't want to ruin a young guy's career on the basis of that one thing. So I think the policy's got a role to play, but I, I do think people have been able to get away with too much over the time, and this is where we're winding it back now. And it hasn't been hundreds, so that was a misquote. Um, you're right. The actual number of people that could potentially exploited this are, are less than 10. Now, Doc, um, obviously, thanks for your insights on that. Um, obviously, the AFL policy, also put way back in, in 2005, probably needs a little bit of a tighten up. But talk us through this new book, mate, The uh, Healthy 100 Ways to Be Healthier, Happier and Live a Longer Life. Well, it sounds like it might be a bestseller, mate, because uh, I think everyone's <laughs> looking for the uh, mm. the secret potion. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, look, this was this is, this is the book. I mean, it's just come out. And you might say, what are you writing about, Doc? But you know, I've come from a background in high performance in sport. We talk about all the things you've got to get right to look after yourself. It's the amount of sleep you need. It's, it's how you train. It's nutrition. It's mental health. It's recognising signs of an early injury and reporting that. And I thought, well, you know, and I deal with, you know, my population group, traders of elite athletes now start at about age 50 and go to about 90, right? So I'm dealing with people every day that want to be playing golf and they want to be on their boat cruises and they want to be walking their dog and going out to the footy. And so what I've talked about is really applying the responsibility of looking after your own health going forward. And so it, it's a concept of, of self-help. It's, 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 it's a bit medical, but there's a lot of fun in there about you know, why we need holidays and why we need sunshine and why red wine's good for you and chocolate and how much caffeine should we drink. I mean, the basic medical things are why we have our health checkups and why exercise is medicine, which is the background I've come from. So I'm talking about high performance in life and your career and your corporate world rather than high performance in sport. Because we all know that illness slows us down. It doesn't matter whether it's the flu. And I think during COVID, people, a lot of people I knew lost a sense of control over their own health because it was such a weird thing we were going through and it was such a strange pandemic. People were really concerned. And so what I talk about is your body is a pharmacy. It produces immune agents. It produces things to help you sleep and reduce blood pressure and reduce cholesterol. So all the things that we rely on a doctor to get a pill for we should be doing in our life. And so the four key pillars I talk about is exercise, I talk about nutrition, but I talk about mindset and your personal development and keeping yourself challenged. And I talk about social connectivity because one of the things that really, if you talk to people that live a long time, they really enjoy their day. And there are certain zones in the world called blue zones where people live to 105, 110. And it's social connectivity in those parts of the world, Japan, um, Greek islands, Sardinia and Italy, for example, are three of the blue zones. And there's no nursing homes or aged care there. People, the generations look after each other. So this 100 ways to live to a healthy 100 is about all the things we line up to keep ourselves healthy. Put my doctor colleagues out of work, guys, if you like, because yeah. you know, clearly at the start of the book, I say, why do we age? Why do we die? So this is all about aging slowly. It's not about not aging because my mates initially said, oh, doc, I don't want to live to 100. And I said, no, we're not talking about being 100 on an oxygen cylinder in a nappy in a nursing home. We're actually talking about being 90 to 100, 105 and playing golf and going on your trip to the Bahamas and still walking around. So it's it's about slowing down the ageing process. And the upside of that, of course, is that medical care is improving dramatically with all the things that killed my parents or my grandparents and, and your grandparents, Jack, and, and Warren, I dare say, were, you know, prostate cancer, bowel cancer, breast cancer, heart disease. Our grandparents died from those. Now people are living with breast cancer, living with bowel cancer, living with skin cancer because medical care is improving so dramatically, particularly if you find out that you've got a medical condition. And so why shouldn't we be staying healthy through our 80s and 90s and up to 100, 
because we find out about good medical care and we become our own best carer because we're exercising, which is producing all those pharmacy drugs that uh, you go to your doctor for. Yeah, it makes sense, Doc, because um, I always had the theory that when I was playing professional sport and even nowadays, your body is your business. If if you want to last, you've got to look after it. And as you say, you you look around the world, we're all about a quick fix. Give us a tablet so we can do this or and even we talked just before about the illicit drugs policy. Half the people do it for a quick hit. But yeah. if you can invest in yourself, then uh, you're halfway yeah. there. Appreciate yeah, well, your time, mate. That's all right. No, well, thanks chatting to you. I know we've covered a few simple things today, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll talk again down the track, boys. And uh, anyone else who wants a decent read, The uh, Healthy 100, 100 Ways to Be Healthier, Happier and Live a Longer Life by Dr. Peter Larkins. At drpeterlarkins.com is where you get it. You can also get it in bookstores and Amazon and Booktopia Treaders, but drpeterlarkins.com, my website, people can get it and straight give you a link on how to get hold of it. And as I used to say, mate, at all good bookstores, but we generally have them online nowadays, don't we? We do online, but my mates have been going through all the airports. In the last week, I've had photographs from Cairns, Sydney, Brisbane, Wollongong. All the airport stores have got it too. So if you travel, you'll be able to see it. Have a good read on the plane. Brilliant, mate. Thank you for your time. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Big Deal. Before you go, don't forget to join our community by subscribing for free at www.thebigdeal.au and get a weekly email bringing together the hottest sports deals, breaking sports biz news as it happens and much more. Join me at www.thebigdeal.au.